Jim Keenan. I'm the Vice Provost for Global Engagement here at Boston College. Um, this is our uh, series that we've developed for global scholars who are here on campus. Uh, this is our seventh uh, lecture that we've developed this year, our inaugural year. And it's a delight to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Basil uh, Javier. Uh, who has been teaching both Western and Eastern philosophies in Brito College, BC, um, and also known as Aral Anandad in Mandurai, uh, India, since 1998. He was uh, formerly the president of that college. He's presently a postdoc fellow at Monaghan Institute here at BC and a visiting professor to a number of colleges and universities. He bagged University Gold Medal for an MA in Philosophy from Hodakari University in India. He has published three books, more than 30 articles in journals and, and, and in, as chapters in books, and presented more than 50 research papers in national and international conferences. His research interests include post-Marxism, post-modernism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, subaltern uh, philosophy, folk philosophy, and ethno philosophy. He guides PhD research scholars and visited Singapore and Australia on academic grounds. As a Jesuit priest, he offers consultancy services to social movements of the subaltern and gets involved in their struggle. He serves as a resource person for refresher courses organized by UGA, a UGC, HRD centers for the government of India in the universities and has been in the UGC and AAC peer team. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have him with us. He'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then there'll be about 20 minutes uh, set aside for questions. Um, we'll do us. Good evening to all of you, and uh, I would like to also welcome all of you to this presentation. In the beginning, I would like to thank the Office of the Global Engagement and the Office of International Scholars and uh, Students, especially the Vice Pros. Uh, it's difficult to pronounce, we don't have that portfolio here. <laughs> uh, Reverend Father. Uh, Jim, we call him. And I would like to also briefly remember all the office people, Brian and Co. And I would like to specially thank my Lonergan Institute and uh, Professor uh, Pat Byrne is here, the director and the associate director Jerome Wilkins is here. And uh, without that fellowship, my existence here in Boston College is not possible. I am very grateful to them. And I would like to welcome all of you. Uh, and I think you are here for three reasons. One thing you love India. <laughs> Second thing you love Dalits, the oppressed people of India. And third thing you love Basin. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you are here. And I'm very happy. A good number of learner Ben. Uh, colleagues are here and uh, my Jesuit friends are here and I find a good number of professors, students, I am very happy. I am called, I, am, I was, as was introduced, I was the president of a college and I am always called student friendly president. So I was <laughs> always happy. That's why I invited, I rather uh, gave the invitation to number of quarters to invite students because I would like to speak to students. Young generations would be inspired. So I don't know that I would inspire you, it's a different story. Now, with that few introduction, let me start my presentation. Good number of my friends are with me through uh, Zoom. India now it is midnight. 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and I think some of them are with me, my, especially my Dalit friends. I welcome all of them. Uh, 
I think they must be watching me. My project here in Boston College is a comparative study of common sense philosophy of Bernard Lonergan and the Ethnic philosophy of Dalits of Dalits. That is, that's what I am doing. But here, for two, three reasons, I have taken this topic because it's an international forum and you will be interested in listening to India. So that is my first thing. Second thing, with regard to Lonergan, you are any experts. You know Lonergan better. Uh, and of course, uh, I, my project is not at work, it's incomplete. So probably if you give me uh, next chance, I will talk about the comparative uh, side. And the third thing, time constraints. Now, some preliminary clarifications. I am not going to talk about philosophy of Dalits. You may have heard about philosophy of Dalits especially Dr. Ambedkar, we have got a good number of people, even in every state, like I come from Tamil Nadu, we have got another great thinker, Ayodhya Dasa, Ayodhya Dasa Pandita Bikha. We, we have got plenty of Dalit thinkers, Dalit philosophers. So I don't, I am not going to talk about them, rather I am going to talk about Dalits of Dalits. This is what I am going to explain to you. So I want to explain what is Yathuma philosophy, then what is Dalits of Dalits. The so two things I will explain to you. These are our initial clarifications I would like to give you. So, I have got just two sections. First, very short section, introduction. I have to explain, as I told you, the, the two things. Then, I will plunge into philosophy. This is the technical side. Uh, I will start with first and second year. Then, I will go into the sixth year. It will be a little uh, philosophical. I hope you will enjoy it. And this is a summary of my book, which I published two years ago. Out of my own research, uh, I would say Donatan was studying Thomas Aquinas for 10 years. I studied about this Arundhati years, 10 years. I was more or less living with them, uh, understanding them. So this, this book is about 400 pages. Now you are asking me to speak to you for just 40 minutes is, is, is a rope, rope walk I have taken as a challenge. I will do my best. And I have dedicated the book to Mrs. Ramayi, who was a manual scavenger in Badamudurai, from where I come, and to all the sanitary workers of India, and to all my dear beloved Arundhati brethren, they are the Dalits of Dalits. And interestingly, my book was one among uh, the top 10 books in Amazon, uh, India, in the ethics side, okay, so uh, uh, until very recently. Uh, now, Yathuma philosophy is short introduction. In the context of post-colonial colonialism, ethno, ethnic is becoming very popular. In the third world countries, researches are done on ethno medicine, ethno chemistry, ethno botany, ethno history, ethno-economics, and so on. But unfortunately, ethno-philosophy is an enigmatic word to academic philosophers. Neither in the West, nor in the East is it done. Only in Africa, certain group of philosophers are doing this. Generally, when I give an introduction, I have, I have a section on African philosophy, but due to, again, time, I am omitting that. They have got now contemporary African philosophy, four types of philosophy. One, uh, ethno philosophy and philosophy of sages. This is what I am combining these two and the traditional type of philosophy, professional philosophy. Then the fourth one is the nationalist philosophy. Similarly, lot of researches are done with regard to folklore. You might have heard about folklore. But for example, folk music, folk drama, folk dances, and so on. But unfortunately, folk philosophy, under. Ethno philosophy is in a way folk philosophy because in both philosophy of a particular ethnic group or a particular folk is taken for research. I would like to give you an analogy. Analogy of an ethno botanist or ethno chemist. Indigenous people use a particular herb like basil, my, my name basil, <laughs> for medical purposes, as you know. But now they may not know the chemistry part of it. They know this is. Put for 
so such and such thing. Now, what is the duty of an ethnochemist? They will give the botanical name, name, and they will give the chemical. Even I do not know about these things. I have not studied the chemistry. This is what I am going to do as an ethno philosopher. I would like to understand the ordinary people, and I am the voice of the voiceless in a way. I am, I am philosophically interpreting. This is what I am doing. Is Hermeneutical, I am sorry, phenomenological hermeneutics. The phenomenon of bells of belief is interpreted philosophically. In Gadamer's words, fusion of horizons, two horizons, horizons of the folk and the horizon of a philosopher. This is what I am going to do. And the second, I have taken this quotation from one Udora Guruka, an African thinker. He says, I mean, ethno philosophy is an is property of a community rather than active an individual. Is an open denial of Plato's maxim that the multitude cannot philosophize. Uh, this is what is an open denial. So I am giving another two quotations from uh, important quotations from African philosophers. So I need not read everything, certain things I will skip and in the QA time you can ask. I may not read everything, I have got plenty of slides. So inspired by the ethno philosophy of African philosophy, I am doing this particular ethno philosophy of Arundhati yes. They are the untouchables of the untouchables of India and this is the first attempt in if not Asia, India. Apart from analyzing their myths, proverbs, worships, rituals, I am, I am also understanding their identity construction. And that last part is very important. I will come back to that point later. So, Ethnoma philosophy, as I told you, is folk philosophy, philosophy of the periphery. Philosophizing is part and parcel of human nature. Antonio Gramsci says all men are philosophers by defining the limits and characteristics of the spontaneous philosophy, which is proper to everybody. Carl Jasper says man cannot avoid philosophizing. So no part of the world where humans never reflect on the basic philosophical questions. But unfortunately, great systems of philosophy are only studied in Western or India. Detailed traditions are ignored. I am not happy with the word as I have written in inverted comma. That means famous classification. In India, if you take only Sanskrit philosophy, Advaita Vedanta, Yoga, those things are only discussed. And uh, even Tamil philosophy, the early Tamil philosophy is only discussed. And uh, even Western, I was browsing through the, the native American philosophy, very little. Uh, very little. As you know, the ordinary people never express their philosophy in written form, rather orally, proverbs, myths, celebrations, worship, worships, and so on. The unarticulated philosophy. In other other way, this is the implicit philosophy. Now what I am doing, I'm making it explicit what is implicit, this is what I am doing. So I would like to give you a short ethnography of Dalits of Dalits, so you can understand them. So very brief. So cultural diversity, you know, of India. <coughs> diversity is okay, but hierarchy is bad. This is what the Indian phenomenon. Homo hierarchicus, the famous book by uh, French anthropologist Louis Demo. He worked in my village where I teach philosophy a few years ago. So, we did not pass it, I did not meet him. And one last from a dharma, you know, even dharma, we question the core dharma, and Dalits are supposed to be the panchamas, avarnas. And jati and varna is different, you know. So, in, in the contemporary terms, we call upper caste, backward caste. We are not happy with the words again. Okay? Upper caste, backward class, backward most backward and the Dalits. You see how many communities, these many communities are there in India. 
it is the very clear start start indications. So 1,300. Uh, when I talk about Dalits, even uh, tribals, tribals, seven seven hundred. And this slide also is important because when I explain the myth, uh, the anthropology of food is very important. I, I think you know. Huh? See, so here I am enjoying beef uh, and mutton. <laughs> For everything, but in India it's restricted. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> if you are a beef eater, you are a diet. Mm -hmm. yeah. No problem. Uh, uh, even even in the Jesuit communities. <laughs> if you are in the village, it is not served. We don't cook. We are not supposed to cook. Otherwise, we will be attacked. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kerala is a little different. I know. Karnataka uh, also a little. And this is a very important point. Dalit hierarchy. And so far, people have not paid attention to this particular part. If you take, there are 76 Dalit communities, I, I would call them ethnic groups, and they are categorized into three categories, okay? And uh, and my Arundhadiyas are at the bottom rung of the society. And you have heard about only Parayas, okay? It is not the case. So this, uh, now we are, we see about how this Ukraine war, but in India, we won't bother with the different story more you are the elections. Okay? And uh, Tamil Nadu, if you take, we were worried about how do you call putting a paraya? Paraya is a very derogative word. It's like calling uh, uh, the young word in, in America. Okay? It's a very derogative word. That's why in the previous slide, see, we are not supposed to call Pallar. You should call them Devendras. In the same way, Sakliya, you should not call them. It's a very derogative term. Arundhadiyas. In the same way, Paraya, no. Only Aditradiyas. That's what we have to call. And another, I put it this. Uh, another point I have forgotten. Okay, let me continue. So the counterparts in India, if you take, they are mostly cobblers and scavengers. In Tamil Nadu, they are Arundhadiyas. In Andhra, Telangana, Karnataka, they are called Madhikas. The Magars are supposed to be the, uh, the Parayas. Okay? And Magarashtra, they are Mwam. Whereas uh, Magar is the another little upper caste. Ambedkar comes from that particular community. And Gujarat and Rajasthan, they are Bangis. They are supposed to be the scavengers. Bihar, and Now, Let me go. And this is an important point. Culture is bunker for Dalits. You know that so many atrocities are done against Dalits. We experience indescribable sufferings and sorrows. In spite of these sufferings, these subalterns live their life. Not only they live, rather they celebrate life. They sing, they dance, they feast, they enjoy life. From where do they get this impetus to live? That is my basic question. This is the question I ask as a philosopher. The answer is culture. Culture is a trench or bunker where the Dalits and the oppressed hide themselves in order to protect themselves from the sufferings and the agonies of life. The supporters not only hide but also take weapons from their culture to fight against caste and so on. In the last chapter I will do it. With regard to the research methodology, the first section in my research and the book, I am giving the ethnographic data, that is very important, but here I am giving very little. The second session is the uh, philosophizing. So ethnography, I have culled out from the literature because about Dalits, there are a lot of literature. But about Dalits of Dalits, no literature. Very few literature. Okay? And that is available only in our vernacular. My duty was I was translating most of the things into English because internationally it should be uh, spoken. This is my idea. And I have also done field work, oral literature, participant observation, in-depth interview, unstructured interview are my ethnographic tools. And uh, I have already told you, so these are the words they do. So, which means they are the most bottom of the caste pyramid. So, 
So this is a hut. Also, I lived in this particular village called Ettakapati. So village in Sivagasi district of Tamil Nadu. I lived for three months together. I mean, then for ten years I have been visiting so many people. Uh, so it is more or less the end of the hut, thatch roof. But now it's slightly better. You, you get roofs, mm -hmm. tiles. And this is how, in an unhygienic way, pigs are reared. That's why uh, people, people are against this beef, pork. So the typical are under the women. So they are not supposed to have upper garments those days. Due to agitations, now they are having. It's the whole, again, debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar. So Ambedkar always is found with court. Gandhi uh, is a basic difference. Okay. And this is the cottage industry. They make uh, the leather. This is their work associated with the leather works. They are despised upon. And they do some musical instruments. In the Commonwealth, they cannot take water. So, in Brook, they are getting water. In some places now, things are getting better. And even they cannot go to a you know, shop where others buy vegetables or things like that. So they have to they have, to have their own shops. So this is a simple shop with the help of NGOs and some PJSPs are also doing lot of work for these are in the years. And some of the field work pictures, just to break the monotony I'm giving you. So those days I interview so many people. Around a hundred hours I have got material. So Upanishads, I'm giving a different interpretation. Conditions. Yeah. Uh, he's a avenger uh, man. We call him Tata recently passed away. And he gave me a lot of stories, myths, proverbs. Okay. Now I come to the philosophy as such. Let me, before that, I give a section on consciousness. I am taking it for granted. What I am doing is collective consciousness. Okay? So I am skipping all these areas. So consciousness is understood as socially and culturally constructed. This is what I am, my basic assumption. And the Tuna philosophy from Proverbs, I have collected around 100 Proverbs and I have translated into English. The so-called high caste people use some proverbs about their caste to portray their superiority over the other people. Brahmins and God are one. And there are, they also produce certain other proverbs about the so-called low caste people to despise them. The oppressed simply use them by absorbing and assimilating the ideology of the oppressor without critically looking at it. Oppression is multifarious. Certain people in the society are oppressed not only politically, economically, socially, and culturally, but also linguistically. Proverbs do this job. Language abuse is one of the most forms of social oppression that we oppressed. It's only one side of the coin. So counter proverbs are also now some the sages we call, some of the Arunda the leaders are now producing. So I will come back to that later. So when we study the social consciousness, Dalit consciousness, the three important things. One thing is submissive consciousness, aggressive consciousness, and assertive consciousness. So, so submissive, we go to the villages, people accept the ideology. They work, they still clean the shit right, of human creatures still. And aggressive, they go violent, they go. Uh, and assertive consciousness, they act proactively. And from the now let me go to the myths. I have taken only the origin myths. And if you take India, every caste, but we have got uh, every caste has an origin myth, interestingly. Okay? And this particular, so like we have got Bible only one origin myth, but here we have got twenty. And this is a simple story. There are seven versions of a simple story. Once there live two brothers, they belong to uh, Kamala Thar asked, they had nothing in the world except cattle. The elder brother asked God to divide the property. God asked the elder brother to choose either the lying cows or the standing cows. He told God that he would prefer the lying cows. The elder brother was dividing 
the standing driving home the standing cows some of the lying cows also got up and began to walk choosing the lying cows the elder brother went in the huge loss <laughs> okay so finally there remained only a few old cows and bony cows the cows began to die one by one not able to buy any food the elder brother began to eat the meat of the dead cows he was expelled from the community for having eaten the meat of the dead cows there was a belief that the descendants of the elder son are arundhati as yes, the progeny of the younger brothers are amrata the upper caste so this is how the story goes the immediate message of this myth arundhati's rights were taken away by others by cheating and conspiracy that's why they are now made economically poor and socially backward and the philosophical excavation deeper meaning in the beginning there was one community equality fraternity a golden period it is there everywhere even in christianity garden of eden and in hindu mythology ram rajya and krishna's gogla in communist terminology primitive communism classless society and few binaries are here you find elder and younger elder symbolizing the past no division of property on the other hand younger brother new generation symbol of private property property another binary dying and standing lying presents the old to die on the other hand standing willing to accommodate changes and in the myth god is portrayed as a not as a hero but as a villain because god is responsible for this division because most of these atheist movements are now atheist and there is one particular story where the younger brother plays the flute okay so the flute and the meat two different symbols so i am now trying to understand the whole phenomenon two conflicting love and swirl life world this alien phenomenology deals with how a noyama is constructed in and constituted by consciousness it is an individual noyama which we are talks about but this can be extended further and the two worlds can be called social noyama the another crucial issue here is beef eating i have talked elaborately on that uh i'm skipping the popular consciousness of arundhati is also there is a problem of contradictory consciousness and when you can she talks about that it has one side they are proud of eating beef on the side sharing the common belief of the indian consciousness they also feel inferior then the intertextuality so you will find the resemblance of mahabharata story now i go to the religion side in the religion we is not a religion actually this is worship we call worship the madurai deity is an important important deity there are plenty of deities pantheon of gods you know okay pantheism uh, and i am going to talk about only madurai viran and one Naladambi Swami. So Madurai Biran, they are worshiping Madurai Biran, but he lived five centuries ago in Madurai. Okay, he was a. Uh, you can read some of these things. I will. Then he he had already a wife, and uh, he he had love affair with uh, the wife of Tirumalai Nayak, a king. So king ordered. killing of this madurai here so now people started worshiping so this is a simple temple madurai viran and gopi and vallai now madurai viran worship the arundhatis could not openly protest against the unjust murder of their praised leader instead they began to venerate him as their hero and later worship him as a protector god such a divinization of victims of injustice is the powerful weapon of ubi is what we are now telling So the James Scott, we have heard about the book, so I am skipping this. James Scott theory, whole theory. Then in another B, it's an another uh, deity. Again, the intercaste marriage is not possible. This word, uh, you know, okay. And when, when you allow the girl belonging to another caste, either both of them will be killed or one of them will be killed. Uh, so once you kill them, they people venerate them. 
No, this is my next theory. I am now uh, now the story we might follow. Okay, so they stab you to uh, death, and uh, as a dead bat, Arundhati has gave him uh, okay deep soup which he was not supposed to take, but he took it. So I am now analyzing this, and I am now telling uh, this is what in boundary situations boundaries are crossed in first. Sense existential sense, then sociological sense. In existential boundaries, social boundaries are crossed. So I am now uh, driving a theory. Love and lust are existential boundary situations, you know. And uh, with the concepts from Kierkegaard, Carl Jesper, I am defending this particular theory. And this proverb also, I, I wanted to explain, I, I skipped it. See, this particular proverb. Like a millet is used when grown, superior girls is to be used when she reaches puberty. Superior girls are supposed to be very beautiful young, uh, fair in terms. In India, always when you are fair, people are looking for that. Uh, so that is the colonial mind. Okay, and uh, this is the untouchability is very difficult to understand. See, you are not supposed to touch, but you abuse them sexually. So this is how to interpret. Okay, and I have also short tried in analysis of the whole thing. So rituals, next chapter, the birth, year boring, puberty, marriage, all these rituals I am analyzing. So now, Homo celebratus, famous hardy arts, feast of fruits. So I am writing three important theories. Transition is to transcend and excel. Okay, Peter Turner, you heard about, I am skipping. So Nietzsche, life wishes to ascend and by ascending to surpass self. Heidegger, self-transcendence is the fundamental constituent of the sign. It is a personal phenomenon but social accompaniment. So the People are now telling through these rituals, you are not alone, we are with you, don't worry, go ahead. I think a lot of similarities between even blacks and valleys and all the subaltern peoples. Recently I went to Florida and I was, uh, some of my Indian friends are working with black settlements. And, uh, and I find everywhere, wow, wow, the crowd. So this is a social accompaniment, this is what I would, I would call them because number is their strength. So they don't have anything. No wealth. Life has to be celebrated. That is the Dalit matrix. Now, with regard to historical consciousness, you know what is written is only elite, elite history. As Michel Foucault says, the important feature of writing subaltern history is to deconstruct what is traditionally constructed. And this is what these movements are now doing. Okay? And uh, I am highlighting these things. So they were brave Arudhariyas and Quili was, was supposed to be the first human bomb in the world history, but it was shelved by the historians who wrote history. Okay? Uh, now Dalit movements are highlighting and I am also now translating them in the English. They are writing only in Tamil. Even professional consciousness, again they are scavengers and the cobblers. And now we are telling you are subaltern scientists, especially the tanning process, salting, liming, dehairing, deflushing, deliming, and turning. And particular plant, avaram we call hmm? Cassia auriculata bark is the tanning material for the years, which is the speciality of this region, Tamil Nadu. As it softens the leather, Europeans like it very much. But the whole industry is now destroyed by the colonizers. Okay? And ethnosemantics of this particular uh, Abaram plant is their totem. They are totem. Okay? They worship them. So I think sociology religion, some of the students are doing. And so you can. So in, invention of irrigation, bucket and needle. So all invention of these people. This is what they are highlighting. It's an artisan. Artisan cost became an untouchable cost because of 
the British intervention of the leather industry. Okay, so I'm not elaborating that. So they became scavengers, and I have a chapter on how the toilets are introduced and all those things. And we are telling them, no, you are not born to clean the uh, toilet. No, it's only the toilet was introduced just over 100 years ago. But they were telling, no, 3,000 years ago, from 3,000 years ago, we had scavengers, scavengers, this is what they are telling. No, it is not the case. And although their movements are also now fighting for their rights. Now I come to the last part, the important part identity movement. So this is very important, identity consciousness. So if you take the movements throughout the world, only three types of movements you have got, democratic political movements of European <coughs> origin and communist political movements and the third movement is what we call the identity movements. Mostly found in post-colonial countries like Asia, Africa and Latin American countries. And Gomi Baba, another post-colonial thinker, calls this as third stage. It's an entirely different concept. It's not the third number count. So I have to explain a lot of things, but I am skipping. In case you are inspired, you can ask me, I will explain later. And Althusser, another post-Marxist, okay, is the concept of over-determination. Okay. And this part is very important: postmodernism and identity politics. Postmodernism speaks about the crisis of identity politics and the rise of politics of difference. Grand narratives or meta narratives construct one identity. It argues that identity is not accidental but essential, natural, and inevitable. In this identity, differences are reduced or forgotten. This is very important. The identity politics rejects the existence of the other. Peripheries are ignored. This is very important. Therefore, postmodernism celebrate differences. This, this is what we call politics of remainders. The concept of periphery is very important. Sometimes a periphery, while constructing its identity, Berlin, becomes center when compared to other periphery, namely Arundhati's. That's what I call periphery of the periphery. Okay? So Linda Nicholson, you know better, different feminism. Black women are the most periphery, though we talk about women. So this is what the last part is important. Arundhati identity construction is justified because they are discriminated and pushed to the periphery not only by non-Dalits but also by their fellow Dalits in education, employment, politics, literature, religion, language and media. I have a lot of statistics. Okay. And this is what if you take the 100 years Dalit movements, I am sorry, movements in Tamil Nadu. No? That is what, in the beginning we were fighting against colonizers, okay. So, then the Dravidian movements in Tamil Nadu, we are still fighting against Modi, okay. We are fighting one, one, one of the few states where BJP cannot enter, no? okay. We are fighting. Uh, and, uh, but, Dravidian movement, very good, but they have ignored Dalit's concern. Okay, so when they ignored Dalit concerns, Dalit movements came into existence. But in the Dalit movement, what happens now? Arundhadiya concerns are forgotten. Now Arundhadiya movements are coming up. Okay, this is this whole uh, evolution you can understand. This is what Foucault says: power is not one-dimensional. Power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. Sigmund Bauman, another important postmodern ethicist. Whenever you hear the word identity, you can be sure that there is a battle going on. The identity or liberation movement of Arundhati shows this battlefield. So I come to the conclusion. Significance and relevance and further scope of ethnophilosophy in India. Ethnophilosophy is not only interdisciplinary but multidisciplinary in nature. Though primarily it is philosophical, it is also anthropological, folkloristic, ethnographic, historical, sociological. You, you might have seen what I have explained. Okay? I was not, about, not only a philosopher. An eclectic approach is adopted, so I have used different theories. 
not interpreting the Arundhati Earth phenomenon from a particular school or a theoretical perspective, various theories are made with law. So, sociology of religion and sorry, sociology of knowledge is a very important area. Now, my study gives rather wide opens opportunity to study other such philosophies like ethnoglossary of other ethnic groups like tribals, Goran and the Urulans and uh, nomads, Dobies and other Dalit groups can be studied. And uh, my, this is not my, my, my book, I have titled it places ethnoglossary singing philosophy series 1. This means now I have to go write another one. So, I have already collected for material for three groups. One a tribal group, another uh, a nomadic tribe, another a criminal, criminal tribe. These are all forgotten people. So, okay. Uh, so, this is what I am doing. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I hope this is useful to you. Now, I am ready to answer your questions. I think you presented about six hours worth of work in 40 minutes. Um, so now we have 20 minutes for questions for those who want to focus in on one of those six hours. Yes, Andrew. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. In light of your work and with that, can you tell us if you see signs of uh, possible transformations that can occur, that can be from them up, so from the bottom up of the grassroots? Yeah. Or do you see that the current situation among uh, the groups you described yeah. is uh, of a sort of block stability, that there is no change that is happening? So can you give us an idea if yeah. we can see better days where there will not be not be continued to be oppressed as they are. Well, this is a very good question. Uh, let me show another one simple slide. this because for example about scavenging yeah there has been now uh, the proposal of introducing uh, tools that are controlled by artificial intelligence yeah. the bandicoot that will eliminate the need for these communities to continue to be scavengers as they be yeah. but there has been a criticism that this might mean if there is not the more social uh, Transformation lead them to further yeah. marginalization because we don't have yeah. even that type of yeah. job. It is yeah. inhuman, yeah. but still, it is a, a, tragically an opportunity for something yeah. in society. You are correct, Parvati. Two things. One thing, with regard to the Dalit groups, see, the Dalits who are in the upper ladder, they are able to come up very quickly, okay? And even a good number of them are, are now educated in the States, Europe and they are now coming up. But this particular group, very slow. Even Jesuits who are working among them, social activists, and again academician, good number of my own companions are working with them. Okay? And even they are upset because when they work with them, they are not growing the way they are expecting. <laughs> that is the problem because the oppression is so much. They give, give an example of uh, the bags uh, piled one after another. Okay, you understand the heaviness because they are in the part of rug of the society. So the, it is very slow, but they are growing. And I know not to boast, and we have educated in my college, I have educated a good number of them, and we have appointed few of them as professors. They are coming out now. They are coming out. But this is very, very, very difficult challenge. Very difficult challenge. They are coming up. From the government side, see, 
Now I am enjoying here, uh, I was traveling with uh, Jadio to uh, New York, we are traveling by a bus. Well, the bus pilots are there, okay, and green light, no? But you take India, I got a lot of pictures, but I don't want to give you everything, and you will be, uh, tonight you cannot eat, I see, you see all these pictures, you cannot eat, okay? So I'm not giving you all these pictures, <laughs> okay? And uh, if you take the Indian railway, still open pilots. So which means, uh, people are here from India, you know, government is not willing to change. There are people to clean, no? Once the train passes, then these people go and clean. Imagine the situation. Government is not willing. Who are the government again? They are for the It is both sent. Sent? People, NGOs, and good number of them are now, uh, and uh, activists, and uh, like Jesuits, some of the priests, they are working with them. That's why the Hidutva agenda in the Modi is against Christian missionaries. Thus, we are questioning the basic the Hindu Tua, the Hindu uh, philosophy. Yeah. We are talking about equality, fraternity, brotherhood. Christians, you don't talk about that. This means you don't talk about that. You go away. This is the problem. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Tom? Uh, thank you for your talk. Really interesting. Uh, I have a related question, actually, which is. Uh, so I studied abroad in Madras in 1992. Oh, great. And, um, and one of the things that we did as part of that program was to talk to members of the Dalit community. Oh. And what we learned at that time is that there was a growing movement of converting to Christianity mm -hmm. because it offered a greater sense of egalitarianism and a break from yeah. the caste system. Um, and so I'm curious to see, one, is that movement still happening? Uh, because it's been 30 years since I've experienced that. And then, um, second, what, what do you think is the relationship between, um, or, or what shift does that introduce in terms of the philosophy, the, the national philosophy that you described? Uh, the last part, I am, I am not catching it up. How, how, how did, well, so the, so the first is just, yeah, yeah, what's yeah, happening? Yeah, yeah. Um, the second is, mm -hmm. how does uh, that conversion affect the the worldview of the Dalit community, if, if that is if that is the question. Yeah. The worldview of the Dalit uh, how, how, how does it how does it how does it how does it frame their uh, their understanding of themselves in the way? Of themselves that's what no? yeah. yeah 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 I, I don't know maybe your question. Uh, this is always there's two sides. One thing is from the oppressor point of view, another thing from the oppressed point of view. The oppressor very little, they are not able to change, okay? But uh, the oppressed, lot of improvement, lot of improvement. See, the whole, he salute the uh, parliamentary democracy, democracy system, okay? So introduced by colonizers. Because of that, now people are, oh, we are Christians, we are able to start the colleges, schools, we are educating them. And now there is a lot of changes. Now you take uh, the cosmopolitan cities, now you take Loyola. Now, even last week, it was in the news, Loyola College now, there's this college in Chennai, is ranking so many colleges in India. And third, and if you take Loyola College, now we are educating good number of Dalits. We have got reservation. We have got reservation. Now, this week we have come up with the policy. So, Certain percentage we give to the students. Even appointment, professors, certain percentage, affirmative action. Okay? So, we are giving, this is how we are giving them not a hope. So, things are changing. Things are changing. Can you say a little bit more about um, whether or not there are, there is a growing group of Philly Christians? Because I think that was the first question. Is that is that continuing? Is that happening? That uh, there's more growing than Christians? The, that, was, the, that first question I, I did not address. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with regard to Christians, again, our number is not growing. Okay? 2.3 percent each. The problems here, uh, I have got a lot of material. 
uh, see, when the first missionaries came and converted, they converted only the Parayas, not the Arundhadiyas. Now, Arundhadiya movements are now coming and begging the Jesuits. Fathers, we have converted the Parayas and now they are becoming professors and uh, great, and we have not even touched us. Please, come and touch us and convert us. First of all, this is what they are telling now. <laughs> okay? And now, if you convert them, the problem is the caste Christians. They are now fighting in this. Again, you know the, the so called cross church. But to accommodate them, there is no problem. If you convert, the already the Hauser church model already was studied in India. Okay? So, would you, once you convert the Christians, you have to accommodate, there is no problem. Okay? So now th things are changing. Things are changing, but it's a challenge. Now, when, when we fight for uh, the Arundhadiyas, even Dalits, you know, the Parayas and the other communities, you know, they are fighting, fighting with us. Why do you give them? This is a problem. This is, a problem. This is because we have, this is the Brahminical ideology is there. Though we have converted into Christianity. And it's a sad story I would like to tell you. See, in, in Islam, I am happy. Indian Islam, there is, there is no caste. There is still caste, okay? But, strictly speaking. Hinduism, there is caste. Okay. Christianity, if you are converted to Christianity, you are not supposed to follow caste. But, in practical, practicality, if you go to any villages, you will have, uh, I am using some caste names, like let us say, the, the Udayar, Christians, okay? It's the name of a caste. And one year Christians, the name of a caste. And Vellala Christians, it's the name of a caste. They are not supposed to have, but they are having. This is the problem. This is the problem. It's not that easy to tackle in the, in the, in the Christian, uh, even among ourselves. And now, now uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, I am speaking now, there are uh, a few vacancies with God to Bishop. Now, Dalit movements are now vociferously now asking to give few Dalit bishops. Fight is going on. Okay? And few of us now are arguing now, we have, there is not even Christian Arundhadiyas, not even Christian, Christian uh, I mean, uh, Arundhadiyas priests. You can, how can you pick up then Arundhadiyas bishops? Few of us are now telling. It is not that very easy, not very difficult. Complex ground, Indian ground. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Brian. There's a question online. It says, "What are Dalit ideas on economic transformation? Did this come up in your field work?" Yeah. Uh, good. Good question. Uh, basically, I do not know A B C D of economics. <laughs> I have not studied economics, and. Uh, I am much more interested in cultural studies. So, so I am interested in the culture. And that's why I have not studied much about the economic, economics. And uh, there are now, uh, when you take about, I mean, uh, when you take these Dalit movements, economics is very important part. Okay? And uh, even government, they are giving a lot of fellowships. And even some of the NGOs and even Jesuits economically. There are some projects that can be talked about, uh, but uh, I have got a very small section on economics to be very frank. Okay. Any other question from? Oh. Yes. Yes. Um, I would just like to know a little bit more generally about like your field research and mm. what the relationship mm. was like getting to know the community, building. Yeah, good, very good question, very good question. It's not that easy, no? So, more or less like 10 years, I have to, uh, I have to deal with that, okay? Yesterday, I told some of my very friends in India, they were very happy, Father, please talk about this aspect too, in America, because America thinks that only parayas are the, uh, oh, okay, please talk to them. Talk to them about us. And, uh, and I have gained that when I was reading their SMS, uh, what is that, WhatsApp message, I was very happy. They have cultivated a 
interest in me, they like me, uh, and it's a long process. Uh, and if you see that uh, pictures, you know, I have, I have in that particular village, I stayed for three months, I meet with them. Uh, mostly the, we call forage. And after uh, uh, the scavenging work, you know, they beg literally, and uh, and uh, it is given by high caste people, you know, so called high caste. And uh, they bring that meat, and they they eat them, and I also eat with them. I eat the meat. I drink with them. I stay with them. This is how we have to we know our life. Uh, and in uh, some other photos I have not shown you know, in the field work, and uh, in the shops sometimes you have to sit. Shops means petty shops. Okay, take taking a tea, unlike the here in America, or if you go shop. And you get lack of material. So I, a microphone goes face most of my go face. So it was always on. You uh, record. I tell them, so I'm going to record. Very important, no? Okay. And we do not know. Sometimes uh, one hour you spend, you do not get any material. Waste of time in what will come up. Sometimes within 15 minutes, you get plenty of material. These are all part of the field work. Part of the and once you win over them, they give you more. Otherwise, they will not that openly tell you. See, this is because this is a very crucial issue, you know. You cannot talk about the, the Dalit in group war. This is a very technical issue. And they will not share that it's easy. So once you live with them and talk to them, and uh, I am a Jesuit, so in a way I am in a privileged position. Jesuit priest, you know, okay? And they believe me as a priest. Most of them are Hindus. They are not Catholics. They are not Catholics. Could, could I ask you, um, in one of your slides, you had remainder. And I was thinking of Vonnegut's remainder concept. And all during it, I was wondering, this research that you're doing on ethno-philosophy of the beliefs of beliefs, um, how does that fit into the Vonnegut Institute? How, how, is, how are you engaged? as a member, a fellow at the Institute on this question. Yeah, that is, you should give me Father one hour, then I will talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just uh, <laughs> Lisa, uh, in my, this particular, uh, it is, uh, I don't know, I'm not, uh, in Olagan's insight, the common sense, no? See, see this, this quote, it, this is understanding and being. Common sense communication is that common sense communicates its wisdom in fables, allegories, and so on. The mode of generality of common sense communication is the story, the fable, allegory, through which those who want to understand, those who want to become wise, can have insights. The will will complete their outlooks on life, you see. So when I read uh, Donald Trump, especially the insight, certain portions are tackled. So that's why I said, let me try, let me try. So I am now trying. Yeah, I just thought the remainder concept was rather interesting, talking about the belief in that term. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Brian? Thanks. Uh, in another one of your slides, you talked about various forms of oppression, but there was some emphasis on linguistic oppression. So can you talk a little bit more about linguistic oppression? Yeah. Lisa Williams' dissertation on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, linguistic can be understood uh, in a two different ways. One thing, see, when I meant these Arundha theories, uh, linguistic oppression, Mostly the Dalit groups in Tamil Nadu are speaking Tamil, my language. Okay? And these particular Arundhatiyas speak some other language. There is supposed to be Telugu and Kannada. Okay? So linguistically a different group. And now this is another fight. So now, now they are telling uh, the Dalits, no, no, don't treat them because they don't speak our language, then why are you accommodating them in Tamil Nadu? And you are giving reservation, Jesuit fathers, no. You are depriving of Tamils, depriving of Christians, you are doing that. Don't do that. You understand the problem? Huh? Okay? Uh, so that this is, in a way, that is one linguistic. Another thing, the abusive words. Hmm. You see, the abusive words, no? The proverbs, I did not go into detail, I have a section in 
hours are usually worse. You call them paraya, chakriya. It's a very derogative term. So you, I have got an experience. If I tell that experience, I will cry. So I am not, I am not telling that experience at all. Okay. Uh, so uh, I deal with them. So if you tell them, so you, you are no more a human. You become subhuman. Okay. Verbal abuse. This is what I mean. Linguistically, they are oppressed. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nathan has the last question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, very Thank you. It was very insightful, even for me coming from India itself, yeah. from your neighboring thank you. state, actually, in that sense. Uh, my question is basically from the, the slides that you began the whole presentation with, where you wanted to move away from Ambedkar in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, because he comes from, again, uh, a hierarchically elite group when you consider the, your, the target group. His whole philosophy is around three words, mm -hmm. educate, organize, and agitate. Yeah. Even in your whole presentation, it was basically about that, organize and agitate. These were the two kind of yeah. words. Yeah. But there was no educate in that sense in the whole of your presentation. So how would you fit this in when you want to really move away from his idea of a particular community, especially within mm -hmm. this whole hierarchical status? Good question, I think. First thing, uh, clarification, I am I'm not against Ambedkar. Yeah. And Ambedkar yes, are not uh, against Ambedkar. Our guru is Ambedkar. Okay? No, uh, yeah. what I mean to say is basically uh, you know, that you are moving away in the sense of his philosophy. We are not, I am not moving, I am sorry, no, yeah, see, I'm, we are not moving away from uh, Ambedkar. See, what I said is, we, we don't think that I am talking to, going to talk about philosophy of Dalits. Philosophy of Dalits, there are philosophers to talk about. You understand? There are philosophers to talk about philosophy of Dalits. But ethno philosophy, the uh, people who are oppressed, subaltern, periphery, they cannot talk philosophy. That's why ethno philosophers be we jumping and we become their voice. You understand? So this is an important clarification. So still, Ambedkar is our guru. So we take a lot of philosophy from Ambedkar. So even in my work, I have got a section on Ambedkar. It has got untouchability. His analysis is very important. So we have studied in. Uh, Columbia University, America, and uh, very big mind. But uh, when yesterday I was proceeding, we go to Google, the uh, best academy, acad academician in the world, Ambedkar comes. Okay, he has studied so many degrees. Uh, okay, so Ambedkar is the philosopher for Dalits. It's, no, this is what the, the postmodernism again, uh, we, we, we give important uh, identity and difference is a very tricky issue. So, we, when we say Dalits of Dalits, uh, when we assert our identity, identity, does not mean that we come away from Dalits. No. Sometimes rainbow coalition, rainbow coalition. Sometimes as Dalits, we have got some common concerns. We have to come together. We have to come together. As sometimes uh, as Tamils all come to Dalits and everybody sometimes when the, the central government, Modi is giving some problem to the Nadu government, we all come together. So this is what the identity the reminder is a problem. Okay, you understand? So, I never mean that. Probably if I mean that, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. so, I never mean that. I never mean that. So, I, I, I open the whole discussion because this ethno philosophy is different from philosophy of. Uh, uh, yeah. And as I told you, in, in Tamil Nadu, there's another philosopher called Ayyoki Dasa. Okay. Uh, he's a Dalit from Tamil, Tamil Dalit. Okay. And he is from the Paya community, but we have got some reservation against him. Because his philosophy, he is now uh, degrading the Arundhati Dalits. So we are questioning that. We are supposed to talk about all the Dalits, but how can we talk like this? So, but there got Ambedkar, Ambedkar, I, I got course, yeah, when, when there is a problem in Bombay between mothers and the mothers is one community and the monks, the Ambedkar himself said, no, you should not discriminate. Monks, you should accommodate your surprising mother. So, Bitcoin is a great, great mind. Okay? So, if, if I can, uh, one thing that I heard uh, from Nithin was that he was saying that you do, you know, you do, you all, you, you address the issue of organizing and, and antagonizing or advocating. You also made a big point that you were an advocate, you were bringing their voices forward. But the question of educating, that's what I heard, and Nithin's nodding. That's what I heard. His question was, 
You were talking about organizing, advocating, and agitating for, but what about educating vis-a-vis uh, -vis the elites? That's, yeah, that was basically That was his oh, question. Okay. So I just thought it was a very good question yeah. since we're at a university. Yeah. Uh, your work, how much of your work is not only in organizing, advocating, and agitating, but actually educating? Oh, well, yeah, since I was addressing this issue, I have, I have forgotten that. Good. Uh, education is very important. So only through education we can bring changes, as Father Vijayani was telling. No? Okay? Now, we organize so many workshops for that. One thing is formal education. So we give them reservation in our schools, in our colleges, formal education. Another thing, informal. I have, I have, been, the, I have been a resource person to their movements. So I, I talk to them. Uh, they, they come for meetings. We educate them. We educate them. So don't think that you are meant to do this menial job. You are meant to fly in the sky. We educate them. We educate them. Not only myself, is everybody. So a group of Jesuits are working on that. My own companion is a lawyer. My own companion, one Peramin Raj, and he's fighting for their right. He's a lawyer. And uh, another, uh, another Jesuit uh, social activist, activist is living with them full time, totally committed. Sometimes, a uh, lot of uh, uh, physical illness. He had a problem with his uh, pancreas, problem with his kidneys. So Jesuits are working among them. The unhygienic situation, I have told you now. People are working to educate them. So education is very important. We have started uh, simple primary schools, preparatory schools in remote villages. And we are educating them. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, yes, on that note, thank you. April 6th, and will be given by Father Samuel Hernandez um, from the Department of Theology, and it's entitled Nicaea 325 to 2025, Hermeneutic Challenges and Theological Perspectives. So that's on April 6th. Basil, thank you very much for this enlightening break. Thank you very much, but I enjoyed your interaction. Thank you very much.